it is my great pleasure to welcome today uh, Cynthia Moss, who uh, has joined the um, uh, faculty at HKUST for a sabbatical year. Uh, Professor Moss hails uh, from Johns Hopkins University. I actually need to ask, is this the real name of one department? The Physiological and Brain Sciences, Neuroscience Psych and Mechanics? No. Psychological and Brain Sciences Psych is one department. Neuroscience is another department. Thank and Mechanical thought, Engineering is another I, I department. I thought you'd actually named, okay, so she comes from two departments at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the first is Physiological and Brain Sciences, the second, Neuroscience and Mechanical Engineering. And she's here on sabbatical year, hosted uh, by um, almost every department in, at HKUST. So she's hosted uh, by Life Sciences, she's hosted by Electronic and Computer Engineering, and she's also hosted by uh, Chemical and bio, uh, Biomedical Engineering. Um, and I think, well, let me tell you a little bit about her history first. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst, uh, a PhD in experimental psychology from Brown. Um, she then did a postdoctoral fellowship in Tübingen and um, has <clears throat> uh, had uh, faculty positions uh, first at Harvard, then at the University of Maryland, and finally at her position uh, now uh, at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I think one of the reasons that we were, uh, all, all of the departments at HKUST were so excited to bring her here uh, was precisely because of the feeling we all have that the, the real progress in science occurs at the interfaces between uh, traditional disciplines. And I think no one represents uh, that philosophy and spirit uh, better than Professor Moss. Um, she, as you will hear by the, by the end of her seminar, um, has raised an important uh, biological problem. The problem has computational solutions and engineering applications. And it's uh, just a thrill to be able to see uh, all of those uh, different threads brought together so seamlessly uh, in a single research effort, uh, but you're about to hear that today. So let me call Professor Moss up off the on-deck circle. It's time to go to bat and speak to us about a glimpse of the world through the voice of a bat. It's really been a thrill to be here at the university. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know the students as well as interact with colleagues, so thank you. And before I get to my talk, I just would like to say a few words about my title, which may strike you as rather strange. <laughs> what does this mean? A glimpse of the world through the voice of a bat. As we humans take in information about the world through our visual systems, we take advantage of natural light, you know, the sun or artificial light, um, electrical lights that are in the room. We don't have to individually generate light waves to um, activate our visual systems. But the case of the bat, it has to produce sounds that reflect off of objects in order to find those objects. Okay, so not only does the bat have to produce these sounds, but it has the ability to adjust these sounds. And thus, the voice of the bat refers to the fact that the bat can modify the information it gathers by changing the features of its vocalizations. So before going into the detail of this topic, I'd just like to highlight the point that many animals use sound to guide behavior. And our research has implications for understanding auditory information processing in a wide range of species, including humans. Okay. So just to illustrate a few examples, hearing plays an important role in communication in animals, birds, penguins, elephants, and even nonverbal communication in humans. Uh, also, of course, it plays a very important role in verbal communication in humans and music appreciation. Some animals use sound to find their prey, as the case is with the um, barn owl and underwater um, echolocators, marine mammals. And finally, and I will get to this in more detail at the end of my talk, uh, blind humans rely heavily on sound for their navigation. But as 
you know, the focus of my talk is the echolocating bat, which relies heavily on sound to guide its behavior. And I show this slide with several different species of bats just to make the important point that there are actually over a thousand species of bats that use echolocation. Um, they occupy diverse habitats. They forage for a variety of different foods. So here you see, for example, a bat taking nectar, another bat feeding on fruit, some bats actually feed on small vertebrates. If you can see, this is a little frog this bat is about to attack. Some bats will take insects or fish from water. Here you see the fishing bat has these very large feet, and it can transfer the, feet, the fish it scoops up with the feet to the mouth. And of course, we have many bats that feed on insects. And uh, I'll be focusing today largely on a species of bat, the big brown bat that um, hunts insects using echolocation. Okay, so as you said, the bat's voice provides a window to the bat's mind, okay? So in my talk today, I'll focus on the bat's use of active sensing, um, active sonar to represent the location of objects. So the bat produces very high frequency sounds, in fact, largely outside of our range of hearing, and the bats process information carried by echo returns to localize objects in 3D, that is the asthma of the elevation and the distance to objects. And the success of bat echolocation depends largely on its ability to modify the features of its sounds in response to information that has been received and also to seek a specific kind of information from the environment. So this adaptive adjustment in the echolocation call design uh, will be the focus of my talk today. So I thought I would just provide you with a little bit of background, historical background on echolocation. Um, the modern day discoverer of echolocation bats is Donald Griffin, you see here. And in 1938, as an undergraduate already, um, studying at Harvard, he teamed up with a graduate student, Robert Galambos, and borrowed some equipment from a physics professor to pick up the sounds produced by bats. No one had previously determined that bats produce sounds outside our range of hearing. Uh, Don, Donald Griffin is credited with coining the term echolocation. Okay, so what did Donald Griffin show? Well, first of all, he found that bats can discriminate between objects without using sight. So he tested bats in the dark and found that they could discriminate between tossed mealworms and similar shaped plastic disks. He also found that they could avoid very thin wires, I mean wires that you might not even see, the bats could detect and avoid with their echolocation in complete darkness. They also found that bats emit high frequency pulses, calls when hunting, and when they tape the mouth of the bat, um, they prevented the animal's ability to echolocate or to, 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 and to navigate. If they couldn't produce the sounds, they couldn't navigate. And bats, of course, need ears, their hearing, uh, to hunt and navigate. And plugging the ears prevented effective navigation. Okay. So now to turn to Thomas Nagel, who was mentioned in the abstract for my talk. A philosopher, not a typical subject for a science talk, but he has this very famous essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? He received his PhD in philosophy from Harvard in 1963. Uh, so he did actually overlap with Donald Griffin at Harvard. Donald Griffin went on to earn his PhD and then was there as a junior faculty member for many years. Uh, I don't know if they ever crossed paths at Harvard, but I do believe they met later on. And it, and it was later in 1979 when he wrote his famous essay. So what did he assert? Well, one, some facts can only be captured from a sub subjective perspective. So what, specifically with regard to the bat, he'd say even if we knew everything there is to know from an objective perspective about a bat sonar system, we still would not know what it is like to perceive a given object with a bat sonar system. So in my talk today, I won't argue that we can learn about the bat's subjective experience from its echolocation behavior, but I will present some key observations on the bat's adaptive echolocation behavior, changes in signal design that are very important for carrying out uh, difficult sonar tasks. So for those who are not fully familiar, 
with echolocation here is just a short overview. As I mentioned, bats produce very high frequency sounds. These sounds are well suited to reflect off of small objects in the path of the sound beam. Echoes return to the bat's ears, and with this information, the bat can determine the direction uh, both in azimuth and elevation and distance of targets. And I'll be getting into that in a little bit more detail. The typical frequency range of bat echolocation calls is between 20 and 200 kilohertz. I'm sorry, the, um, and th this is what they can hear, and the emissions are also, and they hear and produce sounds in this range, and the sound emissions can be from about 60 decibels to up to 140 decibels at 10 centimeters. And so for those of you who know what decibels, this is like standing on the runway um, listening to a jet engine, right? beside you. So very, very intense sounds. Okay. Now I just want to say a little bit about more about bat hearing. What you see plotted here is a, a threshold that is the minimum sound level required for detection for humans and a couple of different bats as well as some um, echolocating bird species. So it's plotted here as sound level. So zero dB is very weak um, across sound frequency. And here for the audiogram of the human, you see the best hearing range is in a, about two, 3,000 hertz. And hearing in humans falls off steeply as you get closer to 20 kilohertz, the upper limit of human hearing. As humans age, they tend to lose high frequency hearing. So some humans only hear up to 10 or 12 kilohertz, but manage just fine because human speech, uh, important uh, sound that we all need to process, falls more in this range. Now here you see the um, audiogram of the tongue clicking, and you'll, get, you'll hear more about this um, Egyptian fruit bat in red. So it hears also in the ultrasonic range above 20 kilohertz, but um, its hearing doesn't go as high as the echolocating big brown bat shown in yellow, which is the species I'll be focusing on today. So these animals hear well in the ultrasound range, which is important for echolocation. And as I mentioned, they can uh, use these very high frequency sounds to listen to echoes that can reflect off of small objects. Okay, so here's just a quick outline of what I'll be just, uh, telling you about today. I'll give you a bit more information on bat echolocation. Uh, I'll describe the cues for sound localization using sonar. I'll talk a bit more in detail about adaptive echolocation call design. And then I'll get into some empirical studies in my laboratory where we do quantitative analyses of the bat's echolocation behavior. And I'll tell you about data from a few different tasks, uh, prey capture, obstacle avoidance, and target discrimination. Then I'll talk a little bit more about lingual echolocation. So the, this, these studies will all involve bats that produce sounds with a larynx. The lingual echolocation means echolocation signals with your tongue. So I'll talk a little bit about Egyptian fruit bats that I just mentioned, and also blind humans. And then finally, I'll re return to the question, what is it like to be a bat? And what is it like to be an echolocating human? So here, about the cues that bats use for echolocation. So a bat will produce an echolocation sound, and if an object is presented right along the midline, the echoes will return from that object to the two ears at the same time, at the same intensity, no difference. That tells the bat that the object is along the midline. However, if the bat makes a sound and an echo returns from an object off to one side, one ear will receive a sound a little bit earlier, and at greater intensity than the other ear. And these differences in the arrival time and intensity of the two ears are cues the bat can use to compute the location of that object. And horizontal localization accuracy has been measured in some behavioral tasks. Um, hmm? sir? No, sorry. Uh, okay, I was worried. I was worried. The microphone is okay? I was worried there might be. Yes, yes, very, yes, yes. So very uh, small time differences, but also intensity differences. And bats can discriminate um, the horizontal location of an object with an accuracy of about one degree. Now bats have very large ears, 
the shape of the ears differ across species. There's also this little flap here called the tragus. We also have external ears. We also have a tragus. It's actually, though, quite small. But the external ear modifies the frequency content of signals that enter the ear from different directions. And that's illustrated here, where these are measurements taken from a bat where sound was broadcast from 15 degrees below, above the horizon to 10 degrees below. And here are just measures of the frequency content of the signals. Um, here you see sound frequency in kilohertz. And the details are really not important. Just note that there's a notch in a drop in energy um, at a particular frequency that depends on the elevation of the sound source. So bats, like humans, learn to interpret the spectral cues that come from sound arriving in different directions in elevation, and they can then estimate um, the vertical position of a sound source with an accuracy of about three degrees, comparable also to humans. But where bats really shine and stand out from humans is their ability to measure distance. And so bats produce calls, travel through air, and the sounds return to the bat's ears. And the bat can measure the time it takes from the call to the echo return. So sound travels in air at about 340 meters per second. That translates into about six milliseconds of echo delay for each meter of target distance. OK, so we know from some very detailed behavioral experiments that bats do indeed rely on echo delay to discriminate um, target distance. These were experiments were pioneered by Jim Simmons in the 70s. Um, and Jim Simmons trained bats to rest on a platform and, pick up and produce echolocation calls. The echolocation calls were picked up by a microphone um, on the left and the right. They were digitized, delayed, and played back to the bat through a loudspeaker. So there's actually not a physical object here, but the bat hears a sound that simulates the echo from an object. And the bats were trained to crawl towards the side, which the echo return at a shorter delay was presented. So that could happen, that could be randomly presented on the left or the right. So in this example, the uh, shorter echo delay uh, indicated by A here is on the left, and the bat is trained to crawl towards this um, on this side, and then it receives a mealworm food reward. For, and so with this two-choice experiment, the time or delay separation between the two uh, targets can be adjusted, and uh, you can look at the performance of the bat as it um, carries out this task. So here are data that come from Jim Simmons' experiment, correct uh, responses. So 50% is just chance. If you've got two um, choices, just by guessing, the bat would be expected to perform at 50%. And in fact, if the two echo playbacks are at the same delay, so there is no correct response, uh, the bat performs at 50%. As the time delay difference between A and B is increased, from 0 to 600 microseconds, uh, the bat's performance increases. So let's, and 600 microseconds corresponds to a difference in distance of about 10 centimeters. So you see the bat performs at about 100% correct um, for many of these um, delay or distance differences that were introduced. But then as they get smaller and smaller, the bat's performance begins to decline. And at 75% um, correct, the difference in uh, delay was 60 microseconds or distance uh, one centimeter, and that's what Jim Simmons assigned as the bat's threshold. So these data show that the bats can use echo delay to discriminate target distance. They do so with an accuracy of about 60 microseconds in delay or one centimeter in distance. Now, as I mentioned, bats adjust the features of their calls in response to information they obtain from echoes so that they're continuously updating the features of their calls as they gather information about the location of targets. So I'm going to show you a quick video. It was recorded at high speed um, and then slowed down by a factor of 16. You'll also hear the bats' echolocation calls, which were recorded um, at high speed and also slowed down uh, by the same factor. And you'll see 
um, spectrograms of the echolocation calls produced by the bat. What you see here are infrared lights that were picked up by the cameras, but the bat couldn't see, oops, couldn't see the, the lights. So this is all done um, outside the bat's visual range. This is a mealworm that the bat um, is going to go after. So you'll see the bat fly up um, and s turn around and take the um, insect, but importantly, listen to and watch the display of the calls as the bat gets closer and closer to the target. Scooped it up with its tail, if you notice. Okay. I hope the contrast was high enough. I don't know if we should turn off lights up front here, but well, that was probably the only video that may have been hard to see. So um, here's a cartoon display of what the bat did in that particular uh, video frame. This is the big brown bat, Aptesicus fuscus. Here are data taken from a different species of bat, um, Rhinolophus, which is the greater horseshoe bat. I'm not going to be talking about this species today, but what you'll see is that uh, plotted for both are um, frequency as a function of time. And these, so these are spectrograms of the calls produced by the, the two different bat species. So their structure, their signals are quite different. But what they both show is uh, are changes in the echolocation call structure as the bat gets closer and closer to the target. So what we have here on the uh, x-axis is time to prey capture, time zero. And so um, as the bat gets closer to capture, the calls are produced very rapidly. Um, in the big brown bat, up to 150 sounds per second. Um, the sounds are also very short here. They're maybe only half a millisecond long. Further back in time, the calls are longer in duration, probably three up to four milliseconds long. And then you see the intervals between the sounds are longer. Uh, those are the right rate of calling here, maybe five to 10 sounds per second. And as I mentioned, in this final capture phase, often referred to as the terminal buzz, the calls are produced uh, at about 150 per second. So you see the same general trend where the calls get shorter and the rate gets higher um, for this other bat species. But as I mentioned, I won't be uh, talking about this particular species, but it just illustrates that this is a general phenomenon in bats that are hunting insects. So active listening um, in complex environments involves adjustments for in the calls and the duration which we've seen, the frequency content I didn't point out so much, but the bats are adjusting the energy across frequency. They're adjusting the timing. They're adjusting the intensity of the calls. And I'll be getting to this in just a bit. They're also adjusting the directional aim of their calls. And all of these adjustments contribute to the bat's localization and discrimination of objects in the environment. They also provide us, the researchers, with a window to the information the bat has processed and the information it's seeking. So I won't, argue, I won't try to argue against Nagel. Um, we don't really know what the animal is directly perceiving, but we do have access to these signals that inform the processing of information. Okay. So here is the big brown bat, the star mostly of the show today. Um, so it's a North American bat, and as I mentioned, it eats insects for a living. It produces a very broadband sonar signal, which is well suited for spatial localization. You've heard that it has um, localization accuracy in azimuth of about one degree, um, vertical um, discrimination of about three degrees, and distance discrimination of about one centimeter. Uh, where it can discriminate the delay of echoes of about 60 <coughs> microseconds. Is there a question? Right. So what I've noticed in that is that it always has an accuracy. Um, if we go back to this other slide, it's actually not the case for this bat. There's an upward frequency, then it's constant, and then downward. But yes, the bats that only produce frequency modulated signals are um, 
typically producing sounds that sweep from high to low. Sometimes there's social communication sounds, which I will not talk about today, uh, sweep from low to high. It probably has consequences for how it's processed in the central auditory system. Okay, so we have the big brown bat, and you see these very broadband signals with multiple <coughs> harmonics. So each um, frequency in this call provides a time marker for arrival of the echo, which is very important for this distance measurement. Okay, so now I've talked, you know, the example I showed with a single worm um, in the in the laboratory, it's a simplified environment when I've talked about the bat's ability to localize in azimuth elevation distance. It also assumes a very simple environment, but the fact is bats will often encounter multiple objects. Uh, so here you see a few different insects in this cartoon. There may be um, other man-made objects. There may be vegetation. And so for each call the bat produces, um, will result in a stream of echoes. So each vocalization will return multiple echoes from the insects, from the houses, from the trees. And this presents a rather daunting task for the bat um, because many of these echoes will be overlapping in time. So the bat needs to segregate streams of echoes associated with different objects and assign echoes to different objects. And this requires accurate localization in elevation, azimuth, and range, but we think that the key to the animal's success in this um, daunting task is the ability to control the features of the vocalizations um, over time. I'm going to get into some experiments that illustrate this. Okay, so we'll have um, a review of a few different studies in which the bats are required to localize targets avoid obstacles, and discriminate, target, um, and discriminate different targets. So these will illustrate the bat's adaptive changes in their echolocation call design. So these experiments are all conducted in a very large laboratory flight room. So here you see we have microphones positioned along the walls and also on the floor. We have two different kinds of video camera. We have Vicon motion capture cameras that can pick up the location of reflectors that we place on the bat and full video cameras. So we use the audio and video, which are synchronized, in an infrared um, illuminated room, so the bat can't use vision, uh, to measure echolocation patterns combined with flight trajectories in different tasks. So here is an animation just to illustrate what we can do uh, with the data taken from these behavioral trials. So this is data that was taken from a study of bat going after a free-flying insect. You'll see um, the flight trajectory of the bat here, as, and this is a free-flying praying mantis that will be released from a, uh, by a human. And then here, plotted below, is the interval between successive calls, the reciprocal of this, the repetition rate, and the duration of the bat's calls. So just also slow down so you can hear the echolocation call produced by the bat. So that bat was successful. That bat was successful because the praying mantis's ear was covered with some Vaseline, so it couldn't hear the bat to evade it. This, many insects do actually hear bat echolocation signals and engage in different behaviors to minimize predation. But here in this uh, plot here, each time the bat produced an echolocation call, a circle is displayed. You can see more clearly in the plots below the interval between the successive calls or the repetition rate, that overall the interval decreases as the bat gets closer to the target. The repetition rate increases. The duration of the calls also decreases as the bat gets closer to a target. But what I want to draw your attention to is this um, segment here where the bat alternates between short interval calls and long interval calls. And we refer to these as sonar sound groups. And I'll be coming back to this again. But we believe uh, through many years of um, experiments and some recent data that the sonar sound groups are indicators of the bat's attention to objects and uh, 
present the hypothesis that these sonar sound groups actually serve to sharpen up the spatial representation of objects, the location of objects that the bat sonar system uses. Okay, so I mentioned we have microphones along the walls. Here it shows only three. Um, and what we can do is a look at the distribution of energy across the microphones as the bat flies. And so in this particular cartoon, the bat's head is pointed this way, so these microphones will receive the strongest signals. And um, we can then look at the di energy distribution and compute a beam axis uh, based on the microphone array recordings. We can also animate the bat's uh, control over the sonar be um, beam as it flies, and you'll see one example here where these are the microphones. This is a target that's moving. It's a tethered mealworm that's moving, and the bat, you'll see an overhead view with the intensity of the bat's signal illustrated by the darkness of the pattern. So this is where the energy is greatest. Tethered mealworm managed to get away, as <laughs> uh, it was uh, the bat just couldn't fly um, in tight enough turn actually to intercept it. And if you notice that the beam pattern started to break apart at one point when the bat was facing this way, that was actually an artifact because we were missing microphones um, in that particular experiment. But the important point is that the bat locks the beam on the target that it's inspecting and localizing and attempting to go after. Okay, so um, just to reiterate the point I made earlier, where bats foraging in a cluttered environment, it has to sort echoes from different objects. So in this cartoon, you see the bat producing a call, and then there um, are a couple of insects and lots of vegetation. So each call will result in a cascade of echoes returning from each of the objects, and many of these echoes are overlapping in time and it's a real challenge for the bat to be able to sort all this information. Okay. And we hypothesize that the bat's ability to perform in these complex environments depends on its active control over the sonar signals. So now I'm going to turn to an experiment that directly looked at this, where we train bats to take tethered insects in the laboratory, but they also had to navigate an obstacle. So here you see our room again, um, we've got cameras um, positioned so we can do a 3D reconstruction of the bat's flight path. Um, we have a tethered insect here, and the obstacle is a net that's stretched across the room, and there are two openings, one on the right, one on the left, and, the, and then there's a, a partition net in the back that uh, divides the room so that the bat has to find the target in one of these compartments, navigate through this opening, and take the prey item. And the prey item uh, was positioned randomly on the left and right, and also um, in different locations within the compartment. So now I'm going to just show you some data where we have the bat's flight path. Again, I mentioned circles indicate the bat's position at the time of vocalizations. We see the tethered worm, the openings in the net, and then we're going to look at the interval between the successive calls and the duration of the calls as the bat navigates through the net opening and goes after the prey. So here's the video. So you could see that the bat decreased the interval between successive calls and the duration of the calls first as it approached the net, and then um, increased the call interval, increased the call duration, um, and then as it approached the insect, it again decreased the interval. But we've also looked at the sonar beam pattern of the bat um, calls as it performs in this task. And, um, here is now an illustration of the data you'll see where we have an overhead view 
of the room. This is the net now in the openings. This is the target. We can look at the beam pattern and the beam axis along with the flight trajectory and use the, the beam axis in particular as an indicator of where the bat is attending as it performs in this task. So now here is a video um, of, that of a trial where you'll see the bat um, will inspect the opening of the uh, net. The left side is the compartment that houses the tethered insect. And note how the bat um, points the beam sequentially as it performs in this task. So the sticks represent the beam axis. So the pointing to the right, the opening, the left, and it sort of looks away. Then it locks the beam, again, onto the target it intercepts. So what we see is that the bat sequentially and accurately points the sonar beam to avoid the obstacle, so it has to find the edges of the net opening, as well as to intercept the prey. So this is very much the way we move our eyes to inspect the environment. The bat moves its sonar beam. This particular bat species produces echolocation sounds through the open mouth. So in order to change the direction of the sound beam, it's actually moving its head. Okay. Now I want to remind you again that the bat is producing changes in the call duration and the repetition rate as it's approaching a target. So here you see a sequence of echolocation calls as a bat's um, searching for, approaching, and then finally intercepting a prey item. So now you see that the intervals between the calls gets shorter and shorter as the bat gets closer to the target. Why does it do this? Well, the bat waits for the relevant echoes from objects in the environment before producing the next call. It actively um, avoids confusing um, echoes from different calls this way. Um, it also reduces the duration of the calls as it gets closer to the target. Why does it do this? It does this to avoid overlap between its call and the returning echo. And this presumably aids in localization accuracy. So you, this is illustrated in this cartoon here where we have a call or a pulse. Um, and there's an echo that returns from an object very close by. This Echo may overlap the call, a more distant object's echo may um, not overlap, but the bat can actively avoid this overlap by decreasing the duration of the pulse and subsequently affect the duration of the echoes. Okay. So now let's look at another video where now the target is on the, in the right compartment. And note not only that the bat is adjusting the direction, directional aim of its calls, but here, the radius, the duration of the call is scaled, to the, um, scaled by the radius of the beam pattern. Okay? So the shorter the duration of the call, the, you'll see the beam pattern shrink. So as the bat approaches the net, you'll see that the duration of the call gets shorter, but then before it flies through, it increases the duration again. And now it's reduced again. So at this point, the bat is adjusting the duration of its call to avoid overlap with the net. But before it flies through the net, and this net, I should add, is a very fine mist net, so the bat can look through the net, even though it does get echoes from it. Um, it then is tolerating overlap, if you will, between its um, call and the net echo as it's directing the sound beam at the, the tethered insect. So the duration of the call provides us with an indicator of where the bat is attending along the range axis. So here it's attending to the net, and then here, before it even flies through the net, it's shifting its attention to the tethered insect. Oops, we can. Oops, was that, was that another? Yeah, never mind. So, um, so here's a plot um, showing this 
basic result across many trials. So what we have here is the time of the worm fixation. That's when the bat locks this, the beam aim onto the worm. It's a function of the time when the bat first experiences overlap between its call and the net echo. Uh, reference to when it flies through the net. So there's a clear relationship here which conveys, suggests that the bat shifts the distance of its acoustic gaze from the obstacle to the target. Okay. So I've shown that the bat makes adjustments in sonar signals um, to separate and track objects in the environment. Uh, the aim of the sonar beam axis enables segregation of objects in different directions, and the control of the sonar signal duration um, enables the segregation of objects at different distances. Okay. Now I'll turn to a study um, that required the bat to make very fine discriminations in targets, and the targets in this case were small beads. Now remember, these experiments are done under low level, long wavelength illumination, the bat can't be using vision. So even though these are visually distinct to us, um, they were not um, visually distinct to the bats, but there are different textures to these beads. And in this particular task, the bat was trained to find a smooth bead and tap it um, and discriminate it from one of these other beads. So S plus is the smooth bead, S minus is one of these other beads, and they could be presented anywhere in our large flight room while we're recording the bat's echolocation calls with the, the microphone array and its flight path with um, the video cameras. Okay, and then in this case, this is a very difficult task to train the bats to do because these are obviously not edible, so there's no reward here, but what um, I, Graduate student Ben Falk did, who um, took the lead on this study. He trained the bat to tap S plus, and if it did so, it heard a tone that was delivered by Ben, and that signaled to the bat that it could return to this platform and receive a food reward. So it's a really complex learning paradigm, and I have just a short video that, it, that just shows you one trial. So this is now the raw video. the bee, but then starts to increase its fall rate, but then, then it flies by. that be. What I find so fascinating about the bat's behavior in this task is that it really um, captures what the animal does when it goes after insects. But they're, the, these beads are inedible, but I guess it's just um, tied in with the reward that it <laughs> would normally get. Okay. So now um, I'll show you an animation of um, one trial in which the bat um, is a, we'll look at the beam pattern where the bat is discriminating between S plus and S minus. And note how the bat sequentially inspects the two objects, just the way it sequentially inspected the net opening and the target. So again, these are the beam axis. Inspecting that target, and then it flies past. Turn to tap the the um, S plus, the smooth bead. So here again, you see the the beam axes. You can see that the bat is generally directing 
the beam over towards these two targets. You see that when the bat is far away from the targets, the um, beam, the duration of the call is indexed by the length of the, the beam axis. Uh, the calls are long in duration. They get shorter as the bat approaches the targets. And then um, once it flies past this target, uh, it points the beam and directly um, taps the S+. Plus. So this is now summarized in this plot here, which is, this is what you just saw. Um, time one here is marked where the bat is directing its sound beam at S minus. Time two is when the bat is still behind S minus, but um, is now um, looking beyond S minus. It's increased the duration of its call. And then time three is where it's directing its sound beam at S plus. So what you see plotted here um, is the pulse interval and the duration of the calls. And one corresponds to time one here, two here. So you see that the interval of the calls increases and the duration of the calls increases at time two uh, to suggest that the bat's done looking at this bead and is now shifting its attention to look at this bead. And what we also find are um, these sonar sound groups that I talked about before, where the bat is uh, producing them as it's inspecting the, the targets. Okay. So now let's spend a little time talking about these sonar sound groups. They're prevalent when bats are tracking moving evasive prey, when they're navigating in cluttered environments, when they're discriminating objects, and these are all tasks that require high spatial resolution, um, figure ground segregation, and suggest spatial attention. Okay, so we have the hypothesis that these sonar sound groups um, evoke a sharpened representation of the sonar scene. And in recent um, experiments, we've actually been able to directly test this hypothesis by taking neural recordings from the midbrain of the bat as it's engaged in an obstacle avoidance task. So it has to inspect objects to fly around them. And what we found is that single neurons in the bat midbrain respond selectively to the 3D location of objects. That is, the bats are producing sounds, they're listening to echoes from physical objects in the environment, and the direction and the distance of the object, which influences the echoes that return to the bat's ears selectively evoke activity from single neurons. So the neurons respond to the distance of sonar objects, the delay of the sonar objects, and these responses change when the bat directs its attention to, son to objects by producing sonar sound groups. I'm not going to go into the details of this experiment, but here are just some data to illustrate the point. So here are spatial response profiles of a neuron that um, from a bat take, uh, that's flying around in a room, and so we're able to isolate the activity from this single neuron. And in this case, it responds uh, to an object that's about 40 degrees off to the side at a distance of about one meter, okay? So there you see. Now when the bat produces sonar sound groups, the same neuron changes the response profile and instead responds to echoes at shorter delays corresponding to a closer distance. So we see both a shift in the, the distance tuning and also the range over which the neuron responds to different echo stimuli. Okay. So this suggests, in fact, that the sonar sound groups um, really do evoke a sharpening in the bat's auditory system. And stated otherwise, the 3D representation of the outside world in the bat's midbrain shrinks in volume but gains in resolution when the bat inspects objects with these sonar sound groups. Okay. So what can we learn from the sonar signals of the bat? Well, just to review, um, we see that bats rely on echolocation to intercept prey, avoid obstacles, discriminate targets. And the key to the success of these behaviors are the bats' changes in the sonar signal features in response to echoes from the environment. 
We see changes in the directional aim of the beam. And in the case of the big brown bat, as I mentioned, the bat is actually changing the aim of its head to control the aim of the echo, or the aim of the sound. It changes the duration of the calls, changes the repetition rate of its calls, and which I, I, one thing I didn't get into today, but it also can adjust the sound frequency. And we see that it produces these sonar sound groups that serve to sharpen up the representation of objects in the environment. Okay. So now I'd like to um, say a little bit about lingual echolocation. And here you see a close-up shot of the Egyptian fruit bat. It's not actually smiling, but it, it takes this pose when it's producing tongue clicks. So the sounds can um, then be produced um, out through the mouth. And we've done some similar experiments in my lab where we've used our microphone array to look at the beam pattern of the Egyptian fruit bat sonar signals, these lingual signals, as the bat flies um, to land on a platform. And you'll see that this bat's echolocation behavior is quite different from the big brown bat. I'll just play the video first. Also slow down so you can see in here. Okay, so these are very brief clicks. Each click is um, just you know, 50 microseconds. And the time interval between clicks in the pair is only 20 milliseconds. So you notice that uh, the clicks are produced in pairs, and with each pair, one of the clicks is directed to the left, the other to the right, right, left, and so on. And as the bat prepares to land on the platform, the positioning of these um, click sound beams are quite precise, and you see the angle between the clicks in the pair gets a little bit larger. So the bat, while it doesn't have the ability to adjust its voice, it can still adjust some of the features of its tongue clicking to extract the necessary information to find the platform and land on it. So this is a way of leading into talking about human echolocation, which also often depends on tongue clicks. So this is Daniel Kish. He's president of World Access for the Blind. And um, I have a short video clip that comes from Daniel's visit, actually, to my lab. You know, uh, back to the question, what is it like to be a bat? You can't ask a bat, what is it like to be a bat? But you can ask a human. And so Daniel and a few of his um, echolocating blind colleagues uh, came to my lab to do some, some tests. So here I'm just going to show you just the beginning of one video clip. This was actually from the time when I was at the University of Maryland. So what happens when you don't have certain sensory tools? How does your brain accommodate? Meet Daniel Kish. Right now he's doing something remarkable, riding a bike. Daniel is blind. How can he do this? I am blind as the result of retinoblastoma. I lost my first eye at the age of seven months and my second eye at the age of 13 months. I was expected by my parents to carry on, much as uh, typical kids would. For Daniel, a trip to the grocery store involves a walk through two neighborhoods, a park, a parking lot, as well as crossing two very busy streets. The cane helps him detect objects directly in front of him, but he's also using a more advanced tool to navigate his neighborhood, his ears. Daniel is using sound to see. I've been using echolocation for as long as I can remember, certainly since I was a year old. I learned very early in life to click, and I learned that that click uh, essentially was my light. I was able to construct images from surfaces in the environment based on sonar. Daniel listens for when his clicks echo off nearby objects, 
allowing him to sense not just the object's position in space, but also specific qualities about them. Passing an opening, and then here's tall hedge. Um, but back here, we have pillars, and they flank an opening, and um, this opening takes us into another world. Daniel's technique works a lot like how bats use sounds to navigate in the dark, and it caught the attention of bat biologist Cynthia Moss. There are a lot of similarities, actually, between what Daniel Kish does and what bats do. Daniel makes a, a click and uses echoes from the click sound to perceive the presence of objects. Bats, for the most part, use their voices instead of their tongues to produce high-frequency sounds that result in echoes. Today, she and Daniel are working together at her lab at the University of Maryland to see just how detailed of an image he is able to produce using sound. There are a number of pipes that are positioned in different locations, and if you could tell us what you see or experience with your echolocation um, as you approach the different obstacles. Okay, so I'm passing, I mean, I touched this one with my sleeve, but I'm aware of this one as well. And I'm aware of it, which suggests that it's probably two together. That's right. Although he can see grouped pipes with relative ease, individual ones are more difficult for Daniel to detect. Somewhere in that area. Uh huh. Likely meaning the image he's producing is less detailed okay. than a bat's. The bats don't have this problem, you know? They can detect fishing line. It's just really not fair. <laughs> Nonetheless, Daniel's ability to distinguish between different qualities of sound ranks far above average. Okay, so you can get a feel for the experiment. And of course, you know, a human who doesn't hear into the ultrasonic range is going to be limited um, in what kinds of echoes they can hear. Here are just a few um, images of some of the two other subjects who were performing in this task. And... Indeed, they did find it difficult. These are um, the echolocation signals that were produced by the different individuals. So here's the clicks, and then here's a plot of the distribution of sound energy. So here, for the three different subjects, the sound energy is between you know, two and maybe six or eight kilohertz, here even lower. So you know they're producing sounds that are much lower in frequency than bat signals. And let's see if you want to hear one. Oops, well, it's not so important. Um, but in any case, uh, Daniel and his colleagues have developed a, um, a sophisticated ability to adjust the features of their clicks to some extent. They can make clicks that are appropriate for the outdoors versus the indoors. And um, if you notice the way uh, Daniel positioned his tongue, I mean, it's a very highly tuned click. Um, I personally cannot produce the same click that Daniel produces. But returning to the question, what is it like to be an echolocating human, um, Daniel and his colleagues could report to us their experiences of using, the of using sound to navigate. And Daniel described a very rich and detailed representation using sound. And you saw in the video that he also knocked some, a pole over. And so I don't question the perception that he reports, but it suggests that there are other factors that may be contributing to the human echolocator's ability to navigate. Okay, so what are these other um, aspects of the, um, the experiences that can contribute to human echolocation? Well, use of other senses, passive listening, vibration, touch. So in the case of Daniel riding the bicycle, um, certainly he was listening to sounds in the environment um, in addition to click e echoes from his own clicks. Um, aided by movement, active listening. Um, that means, you know, Daniel and uh, the other blind echolocators, like bats, are sort of scanning, pointing their sound in different directions to get a detailed representation. They also have very well-developed spatial memory to record paths that they've traveled and can repeat them for future navigation. And they also um, have experiences 
that help them. So when Daniel was describing the um, opening in, in the university, but you know where there was a brick wall and there was an opening, he'd encountered that kind of um, environment in the past and could sort of refer back to information he had gotten to make some estimate of what his that um, about the opening in the wall in that specific example. But I think it applies widely. You know, walking down the street, Daniel will know that there are often sidewalks and there are cars, and they produce certain kinds of echo signatures that he can interpret. And we also see the importance of attention to auditory cues in complex environments. So if, if Daniel wasn't attending to an object, he might walk into it. And so we ask the question, do these factors play into bad echolocation? And I say, most certainly they do. And in fact, so I learned a lot from Daniel um, discussing not only his perception of the environment, but also learning what other factors might contribute other than echo processing to the ability to navigate. So I think that in the case of bats, um, we see that they can certainly use passive listening, um, listening to sounds of other bats, but also sounds um, that are produced um, in the environment by um, other species and so on. Um, movement is certainly very important as bats fly and they move their heads. They're sampling information that contributes to their uh, sonar representation. Spatial memory, the bats certainly have very uh, well-developed spatial memory that can contribute to their echolocation processing or their navigation. So it can, the memory and active echo processing can complement each other. Prior experience and learning can complement echo processing and um, spatial attention. So when I showed the animations of the bat pointing its sound beam at different objects, uh, we infer that where it's pointing the beam is where the bat is attending. Okay. So I'd like to close by asking the question, again, what is it like to be a bat, but a bat who fails to attend to acoustic cues in its surroundings? And I had this is just for fun. So that is um, a video recorded in my lab. A student um, in my lab was doing studies of um, bat, bat interactions and how they made adjustments in their calls in response to the calls of other bats. And then it was it, um, edited by my son, who added the sound effects. Okay. <laughs> But now I'd like to acknowledge those who really contributed to the work that I described today. Um, ben Falk did the um, experiments and the target um, texture discrimination. Koshi Ghost built our original microphone array that we used in many studies, um, including the one that um, Ben, uh, the study Ben conducted, but also the one with the net. Um, Obstacle navigation and prey capture, along with Anne Marie Serlica, Yossi Yovell, um, who was a postdoc at the time working in my lab and also with my former postdoc, Nako Molinowski, is now at Tel Aviv University, did the experiments with the Egyptian fruit bats, and Daniel Kish, of course, who was a collaborator on um, the human echolocation studies and research grants. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Here's my whole lab. Yeah. I want to follow up on the question I asked you about the dechirping nature. And uh, you said you study how they actually can change the frequency content. And I thought I heard the great bats, the great brown bats, actually upping the frequency as they got closer to the prey. Right? And I Let me correct. So if you're talking about the sound, the spectral content, yes. that's actually not the case. They're lowering. They're the, lowering as they get closer. Yeah, but they need more spatial rec. Spatial so they're they're producing resolution. Yeah, they're producing calls at a higher rate. The bandwidth is still large, but they the sounds sometimes drop even into the human audible range, like below twenty kilohertz. So it, it's funny because it was a, the chirp going down. I'm sorry, from your side, the chirp going down, and on top of it were two more, not invert de chirp rather than chirp, right. And they have to separate that. And I was trying to think how they do that calculation, right? Because when you do that in radar and sonar, you actually save the signal you sent out to cross-correlate with the signal you get in return, 
in order to do that. They're having to remember where if they if they were changing their frequency content, they'd have to remember that. If they're changing their strength, they have to remember that in terms of being able to do the computation. So I thought that the frequency dependence is actually relevant. You're saying they chirp more often, but they don't change the frequency, even though that would seem to be a survival. No, they are change, they are change, they are decreasing. So the overall, I mean, I could go back to the slide, um, maybe I will in a second. The, um, they are always producing very broadband frequency modulated signals with multiple harmonics. So the signals span um, many tens of kilohertz. Yeah, but they start with the high frequency and drop. Yes. And they can overlap with a, another high frequency dropping too, which is, seems to be that throat forming and so forth is an issue. Because one of the things you showed was they actually can narrow the beam. You know, they must be shaping their mouths to narrow the actual beam they send out. Yeah. So what I, I showed is that they increase the rate at which they produce the calls. And I didn't make a, a big deal about the frequency changes because uh, those are somewhat difficult to characterize in the free-flying bat if um, we've got... Um, the high frequencies will attenuate more than the low frequencies with the microphone recording. So we're, we may have some, art of, some error in our measurement of the frequency information. Mm -hmm. But um, the, let's see, there was one other thing you said that I wanted to actually correct. Um, sorry. Okay. What, was the, what was the well, last thing? I was thing? trying to figure out how they can do it because even at their highest frequency, they still have a resolution that's no more than a centimeter unless they have a high signal to noise and can remember the waveform okay. extremely precisely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so they are making changes in the calls, and there are some experiments that show that bats can actually discriminate changes in echo delay in the, in the nanosecond range, much, much smaller than what I described today. So um, in these tasks where the bat has to report which... Um, target or which, um, which target is closer, which echo delay is shorter, then the estimate is roughly 50 to 60 microseconds. But you can push the bat much further. There's been a lot of work actually uh, relating the bat's performance to an ideal receiver. And, uh, you know, there, this may be for offline discussion because it gets into a lot of detail in some of these experiments where the bat has to detect a change in echo delay. But it seems that the bat's performance is not, as would be predicted, dependent on signal-to-noise ratio. If it's been thoroughly enough investigated, and that can be challenged, uh, but the preliminary results show that there, there are some things that just don't line up with the behavioral data compared with the ideal receiver. But the bats are um, producing these downward sweeps, and we hypothesize that each frequency in the call provides a time marker that's used by the auditory system to uh, register the event. And so it may operate with a different principle than the um, sonar and radar. So what is the smallest uh, object the bat can sense? Well, that, that will depend on the bat species and the frequency of its calls. And now I remember what I wanted to correct you on with the, so, so, um, so some bats produce calls with um, sound frequency up to 200 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. So they can detect very small, small objects, but these high, high frequencies will attenuate very rapidly. So the bat would only be able to detect small objects at short distances. Mm. So like count to sub millimeters? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And what I wanted to say is the, um, the microphone array recordings that we did were with a wideband array with, um, we we're looking at energy at around 35 kilohertz, uh, where the that signal is greater. We really weren't able to look at adjustments in the beam width with this microphone array. Um, but the, there are studies of different bat species that are different physical sizes. 
and produce calls of different frequency. It doesn't appear that they're making adju adjustments in the mouth aperture to change the beam pattern, the beam width, but instead are making adjustments in the sound frequency. I'm curious about uh, the wing of the bat because it, uh, compared to its ears, its wing is much larger than its ears. Would it affect its sound emission or the collecting of the sound? That's a really great question, and we've thought about that, but we don't have the answer. If you noticed when the bat, um, in the raw video I showed when the bat was discriminating the, the beads with different textures, it mm -hmm. always produced calls when the sounds were up, which could potentially um, collect echoes, uh, help to collect echoes that are returning but we don't really know the answer to that. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I sort of have two questions, but maybe I'll ask just one and talk to you after. Um, so from an evolution perspective, why would bats evolve to have two different types of echolocation, um, the lingual versus the ultrasound? And is there any benefit of having one over the other? Interesting, well, so the, as I mentioned, there are thousand or over a thousand species of bats and actually maybe 300 don't even use echolocation at all okay and so those bats rely heavily on vision and the Egyptian fruit bat that is a lingual echolocator does have um, very good night vision okay and so that particular species has a different evolutionary history than some of the the um, laryngeal echolocators, but the information that bats can get from echoes using the, their voice, the larynx, instead of the, the tongue clicks, is richer. And, and so we see especially, you know, the, the only bats that use the tongue clicking are fruit-eating bats that are not chasing uh, insects and relying as heavily on echolocation for survival behaviors. So to follow up on that, for the lingual echolocating bats, would the neurons in the midbrain also selectively respond? Or do you think that the lingual echolocation is just an additive feature to the visual? So I think that if you were to record echo responses from the midbrain of the lingual echolocating bat, you would get some responses, but perhaps the responses would be um, not as spatially tuned. But we, we haven't done that experiment yet. Thank you. So, uh, oh, all right. I was going to do a chair's prerogative, but please. Hi, um, I've got an admission to make. I'm an interlope. I'm a linguist. Uh, when you work with the bats in your lab, uh, I don't know much about bats as animals. How long do you work with them? And I was just wondering if you ever noticed anything that could be individual differences in the way that bats echolocate? Uh, good question. So uh, there are definitely different voices of individual bats. So, you know, I showed the frequency modulated sweep. We saw that there are multiple harmonics. The, um, the extent to which the harmonics overlap, the, the shape of the sweep, the duration of the calls, even some of the frequency parameters um, that they can also adjust can be highly individual. And I refer to social calls that bats produce, that's also individual. So do boy bats have dip deeper voices than girl bats? Yeah. Uh, the sizes of the boy bats and girl bats are um, comparable, and we don't see frequency differences between of them for echolocation, but we have in the context of social communication discovered one call that is only produced by males, mm -hmm. only in a foraging, uh, competitive foraging context. So let me ask one more question that follows up on Kendra's because it was close to the one I wanted to ask, um, but let me phrase it this way. Um, if you take one of the laryngeal locators and you turn the lights on, do you degrade or enhance their mealworm catching? Uh, there's been a little bit of work on that in um, wire avoidance, not insect capture. And if the lights aren't on too bright, 
So it would depend on the level. So you could saturate their vision and they wouldn't do well at all. But if it's in a sort of uh, light level for which their visual system operates well, it can actually improve their um, performance. Uh, thank you. That is very fascinating. I have uh, two small questions, maybe a more in detail in the experiment part. Uh, the first one is that I found that some of the bats, when they are navigating the worms, they kind of miss in the first round, and then they go back on the second round, and they finally get it. So I just wonder what's going on. Did they miss that, or maybe they just cannot turn the, the wings as a result? Yeah, so um, I think bats uh, are often planning their um, sort of approach to maximize the time they have to track an insect and prepare to capture in the wild. That's sort of hardwired. Um, and so even though in the, bat, in the lab the targets may be stationary, they show the same behavior. So they maximize the time they can. Yeah, so they may be inspecting the location, looking at the, the trajectory of the, the insect. And one point I um, didn't make in this terminal buzz, when the bat's producing calls at a very high rate, this is typically about uh, 50 to 100 milliseconds before capture. At that point, um, the bats don't actually have enough time to use the echoes to... Um, guide their behavior, because the reaction time for processing the echoes and then initiating an appropriate motor response, there just isn't enough time. So the bats really do need to predict and plan their capture of the insect capture in order to uh, be successful. So uh, I think part of it is in that pre-capture phase, uh, getting as much information for planning the final attack. I see. Um, the second one is that when, I'm, uh, when I notice when you put a net with two holes and then you put the worm in the other par apartment, I always notice that the bats always go to the, the closest ho hole that is close to the insect. So does it deliberately choosing that hole or... Um. <laughs> well, I can elaborate a little bit on the experiment. So we used a video system for these ex uh, these studies that um, had a memory buffer of only about eight seconds. Okay, so um, we um, saved the eight seconds preceding the insect capture. And so in some cases, the bat might have flown around and inspected the, the openings and made, you know, gathered more information that weren't saved in the video. So what you saw was the final sort of stage of each uh, trial. So that means they know that the worm is there, so they can plan yes. which hole to go into. Not on every trial, but oftentimes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I have uh, just one question about your um, uh, discussion on the uh, sonar sound group. Um, and uh, it seems that uh, when it is uh, relatively more closer to some objects, uh, the best wants to know, then there appears uh, uh, some time of the sun group. But uh, also in one of your experiments about taxi, uh, testing the texture of, ver uh, of two similar objects, uh, in that trial, it seems that the bats also uh, failed in the, at the first time, and then it turns around to the right S plus instead of S minus. So I just want to know if, uh, if only in a relatively uh, closer, uh, a smaller distance, will the bats use the two of uh, the sound group? Uh, and instead, uh, for uh, uh, when it is far away from the object, it will only detect the like the uh, relatively more basic uh, characteristics, like the only the location or the shape of the objects. Yeah. So just um, to review that particular trial, when the bat was performing the the target discrimination, uh, I wouldn't say that it failed um, in when it went close to the. S minus because it didn't tap it, it inspected it with its sound, but a failure would have been treating it as S plus. You follow? If it had tapped it, then that would have been a failure. Uh, we do sometimes see the bat's production of these sonar sound groups at greater distances 
from targets. And especially if a bat is chasing an evasive prey item, sometimes the distance may increase rapidly and the bat will follow the target with these sound groups even though it might be a couple meters away. Okay, I'm sure there are other questions, and I am also sure that Dr. Moss would be happy to answer them. But uh, please join me in thanking her for a really inspiring talk. Thank you.